My name is Seth Goldstein. I'm a maritime historian. Uh, I'll just tell you really briefly, uh, I developed my love for maritime history growing up on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and my dad uh, was a high school librarian, and um, he worked at Harwich High School for 35 years back in the day when folks just did you know, one job for their whole lives. Um, lucky guy, he was forced into early retirement and uh, so they could bring in somebody younger and pay them less. But my dad didn't mind because he got to spend the last decade of his life fishing and reading books, which is what he really wanted to do anyways. So. But um, dad would bring home local books um, about shipwrecks for me to read. And um, you know, must have been a weird kid, uh, seven, eight, nine years old fascinated by the topic and I, you know, I still remember this one shipwreck today um, where this boat washed up on the backside of Cape Cod in the winter and so the sailors climbed up into the rigging of this historic sailing vessel to escape the icy cold sea spray. Well that's where they were found in the morning, entombed in ice, frozen to death, still clinging to the rigging and uh, I thought that was awesome. <laughs> you know, must, like I said, I must have been a weird kid, right? So um, another thing that happened when I was growing up on Cape Cod was Barry Clifford discovered the wreck of the pirate ship Witta about 1985. First ever authenticated uh, pirate ship wreck ever discovered. Uh, him and his team of underwater archaeologists have pulled, uh, listen to this, 400,000 artifact, artifacts off the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. 400,000 artifacts, things as small as a coin, think like a piece of eight, uh, things as large as concretions. Uh, concretion are objects that have been fused together underwater over hundreds of years uh, by sea life and calcium. So they'll bring up these concretions of like maybe several cannons. Uh, that are all fused together and what they do is they take these concretions and they put them in a nice fresh water bath uh, for a couple of years with a low electric current and after a couple of years they're able to pick away at that sea life and they get these uh, lovely preserved artifacts um, and so these are the you know the kind of stuff that was happening when I was a kid growing up on Cape Cod uh, that propelled me on to this career as a maritime historian I've been studying this stuff uh, you know, literally for as long as I can remember. So uh, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Santa Cruz in California, where our mascot you may know is the um, banana slugs, the fighting banana slug, which, um, you know, just puts terror in all of our athletic opponents, as you can imagine. <laughs> Um, and then I did my graduate work at Northeastern University, um, where I got a degree in global uh, historical theory, which it didn't pan out at first, but after a while, uh, I made it work. And um, I wrote my master's thesis on New England whalers, uh, which is a fascinating topic. You had these um, multi-ethnic crews on New England whale ships sailing all around the world uh, to places where you know, nobody from the Atlantic world had ever been before because they're sailing in pursuit of whales. It takes them to remote Pacific islands, uh, eventually takes them up into the Arctic. Uh, so just a fascinating topic. My other research interests include, oh gosh, all sorts of stuff, uh, shipwrecks, um, the Life Saving Service, which was the predecessor of the Coast Guard, um, the Historic North, that was the other lecture I did this week, the Historic North Atlantic Fishery, um, uh, the lobster industry, the oyster industry, uh, the Middle Passage, which was the uh, dreaded voyage that the enslaved Africans were forced to take from Africa to the Americas. Um, uh, I studied the, the counterculture of the 1960s, in part because my parents were both hippies. Yep. Uh, and, and most recently, the last couple of years, I've spent researching this West Indies trade that I'm about to, to tell you about. And um, it came about really just like organically, like I've been studying all these various topics my whole life, like the historic North Atlantic fishery or uh, tall ships and sailing, uh, the lumber industry. And a couple of years ago, I, I started kind of plugging all of this stuff together. It's almost like a puzzle, right? And I had all these puzzle pieces. I started putting them together and I started getting this really clear picture of kind of, you know, Portland specifically, Maine more generally and even more generally New England uh, and its relationship to the luxury producing uh, plantations of the Caribbean, the West Indies. Um, and so this is what I've been working on the last couple years. Um, I, I'll just tell you, I, I hold a bunch of different titles. Um, you know, dad is one of them. Um, but I'm, I am the educational coordinator for the Atlantic Black Box Project. Uh, we're a grassroots nonprofit dedicated to sharing the region's uh, marginalized history with folks. So uh, indigenous history, uh, the history of enslavement in New England, which is a lot of people are not aware of. Um, and then this, you know, West Indies, this, this economics of enslavement. And uh, one of my colleagues does a lot of work on Maine and the slave trade. And I'll tell you a little bit about that right at the end of my presentation. 
So Atlantic Black Box, awesome, awesome website. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, check out the AtlanticBlackBox.com. My friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Meadow Dibble, uh, is the founder and, and director of Atlantic Black Box, has put together an amazing website with all sorts of resources, books, videos, links. We do a monthly speaker series. We bring in scholars to talk about uh, marginalized history having to do specifically with New England. Uh, really proud to be a founding member of that organization. Been around for a couple of years now based out of Portland. Uh, I am, gosh, what else do I do? I teach, uh, I'm an adjunct instructor of history at the Maine College of Art and Design. Uh, and you know, I, art school students, they don't wanna learn history, right? They just wanna do their ceramics, they wanna do their metal smithing. So I try to take it easy on the art school students. They need, they're getting a four year degree, so they need to take a certain number of academic classes. So I thought last spring, history of, um, history of global piracy. Now, turns out, 20-year-old art school students think pirates are really cool, which is probably not surprising to any of us, right? Uh, most people think pirates are cool. In fact, I'll be lecturing on uh, Thursday on behalf of my historical society, which is the South Portland uh, Historical Society, at the South Portland Community Center at 6.30 on Thursday on the topic of uh, pirates in New England. And just a teaser, they were pirates right here uh, in this part of New England. So if you want to hear some cool pirate stories, come hang out with me on Thursday evening. Um, and then most recently, I've taken on a couple roles for the South Portland Historical Society. I am the director of the Cushing's Point Museum, uh, with lovely little museum at Bug Light uh, in South Portland, Bug Light Park. And I'm the director of development for the South Portland Historical Society, which the Cushing Point Museum is the museum of said South Portland Historical Society. Now, it turns out, <laughs> if you're the director of development for a small nonprofit, you spend a fair amount of time raising your own salary, which reminds me, Katie, I'm going to need that check after the lecture. <laughs> so um, that's me. That's the kind of stuff that I do. Um, I'm very excited to share with you this research um, today. This is... Um, gosh, I almost feel like called or somehow in some way like blessed to have kind of put all this stuff together. Like I said, I've been studying this stuff my whole life uh, and then I'm able to kind of put these various pieces together and I feel really um, fortunate and uniquely placed um, to kind of be able to share this information with you today. So the presentation that I have for you today is Portland, Maine's complicity in the economics of Atlantic world slavery. And so I have a quote that I like to start this presentation with. This is from uh, this gentleman, William Hutchinson Rowe, uh, his Maritime History of Maine, which he published in 1948. Uh, in this book, which he published in 1948, he has a chapter, chapter six, titled The West India Trade. And so this is what I'll be discussing with you this evening. So in this chapter titled The West India Trade, uh, Rowe says, and I quote, uh, regardless of what was to be a Maine boy's occupation or profession, an indispensable part of his upbringing was a voyage or two in the West India trade. So what he's saying here is that, uh, you know, for a young man, if you were growing up in Maine in the 1800s, um, you know, almost an essential part of your upbringing was when you were, you know, in your late teens, early 20s, you would take a voyage or two uh, to the West Indies as part of this trade. It was, it was uh, a trade that was widely engaged in across the state. Now, this would have been an opportunity for a young man, you know, regardless of what his occupation was going to be, if he was going to be a, a cooper someday or a sail maker or a librarian or a banker. Uh, so it would be an opportunity for him to see some of the world, maybe sow some royal oats, that sort of thing. Um, so... The West Indies trade, very much a part of the history here in Maine. Um, now, here's the thing. This is the kicker. You ready? So he has this whole chapter on the West India trade, right? In the entire chapter on the West India trade, he makes no mention, not one single mention, of enslaved Africans or the labor of enslaved Africans, right? And the West India trade is all about trade in goods that are produced by enslaved Africans in the West Indies. So in my mind... This is like a metaphor for how we treat our maritime history here in Maine specifically, but New England generally. Like we put our maritime history up on a pedestal. You think about like, you know, how many schools have a, a clipper ship uh, as part of their iconography, or how many uh, weather vanes with ships on them do you see throughout the region, right? Or you think about the, the state flag of the state of Maine has a sailor on it, right? So. Uh, we put this maritime heritage up on a pedestal, 
but we don't ask hard questions like, where were these vessels sailing to? What trade were they involved in? And so when I read this chapter from the Maritime History of Maine, Rowe's 1948 book, and he made no mention of the labor of enslaved Africans, really the, the engine that's driving the economy in the Atlantic world, starting all the way back with Columbus, and I'll have you know, slavery's legal on the island of Cuba until 1886, right? So there we have a 400 year long period where the labor of enslaved Africans is the engine that's driving early capitalism in the entire Atlantic world economy, completely omitted from this chapter uh, in the gentleman's book. And as I said, it strikes me as kind of a metaphor for how we treat our maritime history here. Uh, love this image here. So this is uh, from a gentleman, uh, Stedman's uh, Suriname. So Stedman uh, wrote this book. He went to Suriname to put down slave revolts. Uh, and of course, Suriname, uh, a Dutch colony where they grew luxury goods like chocolate and sugar. Uh, and this is an image uh, that was from his book. And what the title of this image is, if you can't see it back there, it's Europe Supported by Africa and America. So uh, empires like Great Britain, they overlooked the horrors of slavery in the names of financial gain, relying on labor from Africa and land in the Americas to generate wealth for European nations. And of course, probably most of you know the first cargo of enslaved Africans uh, end up here in British North America in 1619. So this is a map here from a book about the mast trade, and maybe some of you are familiar with the mast trade. Uh, and the reason why I have this map here, you probably can't see it so well from where you are back there, uh, but there's a couple lines here connecting Maine to the Caribbean. And this one here is goods going to New England. It says molasses, sugar, and rum. So molasses, sugar, and rum going to New England and Maine from the West Indies. This is the early colonial period. So this is the island of Barbados specifically. Uh, that trade will later move to Haiti. And then after the Haitian Revolution, I primarily Cuba. What you see coming from New England and from Maine to the West Indies, it says red oak staves, uh, staves of course being parts of barrels, right? Red oak staves, uh, what else? Uh, lumber and fish. So the, the red oak staves for casks to pack molasses in, uh, the fish I'll tell you more about, and of course the lumber. But this was what was in, affect the West Indies trade, this relationship, the exchange of molasses, sugar, and rum for goods from uh, Maine. And that's what my lecture will be primarily about this evening. So we'll start, start off by talking a little bit about sugar production. Uh, sugar plantations considered the first industrial production centers uh, combines both aspects of agriculture and factory work. And there's a great book out there that maybe some of you are familiar with. It's called Sweetness and Power by a gentleman by the name of, uh, I think his name is Sidney Mintz, M-I-N-T-Z. Sidney Mintz wrote this book a while ago, Sugar and Power, and it was like one of the first books to examine one commodity and its important uh, role in history. Um, and I was just reviewing it last night, um, thinking about the lecture today, and he discusses in the, uh, his book how sugar was a luxury commodity uh, and that before sugar, people in Europe sweetened their food with honey, right? And then so you come along with sugar production and at first uh, only really rich people can afford sugar, eventually everybody can afford sugar, um, but it's this very important commodity in, commodity in world history, uh, basically one of the engines that runs the Atlantic world economy. So here's the, the sugar production here. Uh, you can see they're using draft animals here to turn these rollers. They would put the sugar cane in the rollers and then you would get sugar cane juice that would come out and that would then be boiled down to molasses. And this was very dangerous work. Uh, work in, the, in the, both the mill and the boiling house, unpleasant and dangerous. Uh, the work was exhausting and led to horrific accidents. A slave with a machete stood beside the slave who fed the cane into the mill, ready to cut off the arm of the mill feeder in case it became trapped. Uh, Sir Thomas Lynch wrote in 1672 that plantations are subject uh, to abundance of ill accidents, especially sugar works, because they have so many machines. Uh, a contemporary writer rec recorded some of the hazards. Uh, you can see here if a mill feeder 
be catched by the finger, his whole body is drawn in and is squeezed to pieces. If a boiler gets any part into the scalding sugar, it sticks like glue or bird lime, and tis hard to save either limb or life. And then this is uh, my friend Matt, um, very scholarly guy, uh, Matt Anson, uh, went to the main uh, historical society and found this. Uh, this is Nathaniel Knight's ledger from 1734. Uh, Nathaniel Knight was the nephew, right-hand man of Colonel Thomas Westbrook, whom the town of Westbrook is named after. Uh, he served as the mast agent to uh, the Crown with his partner, Samuel Waldo, whom Waldo Burrow is named after. Um, and if you take a look here, you can see they're using some pretty creative spelling, but these are goods that are going to individual workers working in the mass trade. Uh, once again, this is circa 1734. So you can see here, once again, the spelling is rather creative, but uh, sugar and cotton, uh, once again, sugar here, uh, tobacco, uh, creative spelling of tobacco and sugar. Uh, once again, sugar, um, molasses and tobacco and, and some pork for good measure. So these are uh, goods from kind of like, think of it as like the company store that are being sold to the individual uh, gentlemen who are working in the mass trade. And it's a testament to the importance of these luxury goods all the way back in 1734. So once again, sugar and tobacco uh, being uh, of supreme importance. This is a painting uh, in the collection of the Maine Historical Society. And I, I did get permission to use their stuff, by the way. Uh, and it's a painting of the sugarcane harvest and transportation in Cuba in 1873. Uh, so this was a Maine artist who went down to Cuba to paint these scenes, a kind of a testament to the close relationship between Cuba and Portland. Now, slavery is legal in Cuba until 1886, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. The average life of an enslaved African, once they reach Cuba, now this is should they survive the Middle Passage, and you have to remember about a fifth of the individuals didn't even survive the Middle Passage, but should you survive the Middle Passage to Cuba as an enslaved African, your life expectancy on the island of Cuba was seven years. Seven years, because these people were literally worked to death because the plantation owners realized it was cheaper to bring in new enslaved Africans from Africa than it was to properly feed and take care of these people. Their life expectancy on the island of Cuba was seven years. Um, now, Portland's first sugar house opens in 1845, and the sugar industry becomes a major industry in the city of Portland. This is a letter, once again, possession of the Maine Historical Society, uh, to a Portland resident, uh, Elizabeth Mumford, uh, Munford, from her friend who was traveling in Trinidad, Cuba. And I have this uh, photograph of Trinidad, Cuba, courtesy of my friend Linda Ash Ford, who traveled to Trinidad, Cuba uh, before the pandemic. And so that's what the uh, town square looks like today in Trinidad, Cuba. Uh, and once again, the letter here, I'll quote just a little bit of it, to Elizabeth, her friend back in Portland, I should like to spend some time in the country, she's in the city of Trinidad, I would like to spend some time in the country were it not for the shrieks of the slaves, which you hear constantly someone or another being nearly all the time at the whipping post. So it gives you an indication of how horrible this institution of Cuban slavery was, but also gives you an indication of this close relation between Portland and Cuba. You had a lot of citizens from Portland, like this woman here, who are traveling frequently to Cuba. In fact, you had merchants in Portland who owned sugar plantations in Cuba and who would frequently visit their plantations to check on their sugar interests. I imagine that that's what's happening to this woman here. Uh, she's probably traveling with somebody who's a plantation owner uh, in that region in Cuba. Uh, here you have, this is a letter to the owner of the Bark Eagle. Uh, this account, uh, once again in the possession of the Maine Historical Society, is directed to the owners of the Ship Eagle, uh, included a gentleman by the name of Thomas uh, Robeson of Portland, Maine, uh, and he was a participant in what was known as the Triangle Trade, uh, used sugar and molasses from the West Indies to produce rum in his distill house located on his wharf at the foot of what at the time was Ann Street, uh, now known as Park Street in Portland. Uh, rum from New England, often shipped to Africa, 
uh, where it was used to purchase more enslaved Africans, thereby completing the circuit of the Atlantic world economy. Um, you know, a lot, of this a lot of us find this surprising. We think of rum as being produced uh, in the West Indies, but there's so much molasses coming up here to New England that there are in fact seven rum distilleries on the Portland waterfront in the late 1700s. Uh, 1791, Spain's King Charles IV had recently opened the port of Havana, Cuba to foreign trade. Uh, the Eagles, Captain Henry Skinner took advantage of this trade by purchasing goods and services in Havana after selling 13 slaves from Africa. So here's a gentleman from Maine involved in the slave trade. And typically what happened, the way that the slave trade uh, would work, is they would bring enslaved Africans from Africa to uh, the West Indies, um, Havana, sometimes Brazil. And the way that enslaved Africans wind up here in southern Maine is what's known as, as the coastal slave trade, or a second slave trade, uh, a slave trade from places like Brazil or Havana to the Americas. And so you had uh, merchants involved in this trade, they would bring goods down to the West Indies and return for molasses, and while they were down there, they would pick up a couple of enslaved Africans to bring home. Uh, very interestingly, in South Portland, uh, this is where this West Indies trade began. Uh, the museum that I work in is the uh, Cushing's Point Museum, and it's named after Colonel Ezekiel Cushing who was the first guy involved in this West Indies trade. This is back in the 1700s. And so, once again, you know, he would trade goods to the islands of the West Indies uh, in exchange for molasses and rum. Uh, and then while he was down there, he would purchase some enslaved Africans. And we know that uh, Colonel Ezekiel Cushing was an enslaver because we have his will at the South Portland Historical Society, in which he leaves uh, Cato and Phyllis, to his son Thomas, and a seven-year-old girl named Dinah that he leaves to his wife Mary. So this is incredible stuff. A lot of times in the historical record, if you look in census records, uh, you'll just see colored servant, right? Or, or, or maybe slave. They use the word servant and slave interchangeably. And some historians think they did that on purpose to obscure the historical record, which would tell us that they were self-conscious about what they were doing and they knew it was wrong to some degree. Um, so in a lot of cases, we don't know even the sex of these enslaved Africans. We don't know their names. We don't know their ages. So the fact that we know uh, that Colonel Ezekiel Cushing had these three slaves, we know their names. And in the case of Dinah, the little girl, we know her age. That's remarkable information. But that is how uh, a lot of enslaved Africans wind up here in southern Maine. It's an extension of this West Indies trade. As I said, they would bring goods down there, they would purchase molasses and rum, and while they were down there, they would buy a few enslaved Africans. Now, I could tell you about what the lives of enslaved Africans were like in southern Maine, uh, but that would be another presentation for another time. So here we see map of Portland, uh, and I'll quote here, this is from uh, an excellent essay titled Portland as Commercial Center in a great book called Creating Portland, which is a series of essays about Portland history. Uh, and I'll quote here, uh, Jedediah Preble, Enoch Isley, and his younger brother Daniel, uh, Simon Mayo, and John Waite, five of the foremost merchants in Falmouth, together invested in the construction of a large distillery on its own wharf at the far northeastern end of 4th Street. In, sp in spite of local interference due to alcohol-related criminality, this operation overseen by Daniel Isley was producing enough rum by 1774 to meet substantial regional demands. To be sure, Fiddle Lane, which is now known as Franklin Street, in fact, now it's known as the Franklin Arterial, uh, was laid out in 1750, 1756, uh, became infamous for its, quote, watering holes, uh, frequented by laborers and sailors on shore leave in their brief periods of leisure. So once again, a testament to the fact that there's so much molasses coming up here uh, that a large volume of rum is being produced right there in Portland. So here you can see, there's a bottle of screech rum on the left there, and this is uh, for information that I got from Willis's uh, 1830 History of Portland, uh, which is republished in 1860. Uh, and he said in 1787, 73 of the 89 ships that departed 
from Portland Harbor were bound for the West Indies. So once again, that's 73 out of 89 in that year, bound for the West Indies, indicating the importance of the trade in the aftermath of the American Revolution. Following the repeal of the 1824 molasses tax, it became cheaper to produce rum in Portland than to import it from the West Indies. Hence, Portland had, as I said previously, seven rum distilleries along its waterfronts. And then uh, you see this bottle of Screech rum here. Uh, this is still distilled in Newfoundland today. Once again, surprising, right? We think of rum as being a product of the West Indies, but so much molasses coming up here that they're producing uh, rum uh, in Portland and still today in Newfoundland. Uh, here I have a quote from you from a wonderful essay from that same book, Creating Portland. Uh, this essay was titled uh, Comunidad Escondita, Latin American Influences in 19th and 20th Century Portland by a gentleman by the name of David Carey Jr. And uh, Mr. Carey Jr. says, I quote, For much of the 19th century, Portland was a major entrepot of international commerce. Well, what's an entrepot, right? Uh, entrepot is just a fancy historian word, French origin, uh, literally translates into entry point. But an entrepot is a location where goods are shipped to and stored and then transshipped to a final destination. So that's what he's referencing there when he says that Portland was a major entrepot. Excuse my French accent. At a time when Cuba was the United States' third largest trading partner, Portland was one of the major ports in this exchange, and main ships were among the most common vessels trafficking in the West Indies. Ships loaded with lumber, bricks, and ice set sail for the Caribbean islands and returned with sugar, molasses, rum, and goods to stock local grocery stores. And so... At that time, a local grocery store would have a sign in the window that would say WI Goods, which meant West Indies Goods. So these would have been exotic fruits, things like pineapples and bananas, uh, things of that nature. The wealth generated in this trade affected Portland's physical environment. Uh, from landfill extended wharfs to the large homes that remain central to Portland's identity today. So, um, and I do a lot of walking tours in Portland, and I always tell people, we go down to Wharf Street, and I'll say, oh, do you know why this is called Wharf Street? And somebody will say, oh, this is where the wharfs were. That's right, very good. Uh, Wharf Street used to be where the waterfront was. Commercial Street was underwater previous to 1850. <coughs> Part of the reason why they fill in the Portland waterfront in the 1850s is so they can build docks further out into the harbor into deeper water so they can bring in larger ships with a deeper draft, the draft being how deep a boat is, of course, right? And the reason why they wanna do this is to accommodate this growing West Indies trade. So the reason why the Portland waterfront is filled in in the 1850s is to accommodate this West Indies trade. Uh, the author also talks about uh, the large homes that remain central to Portland's identity, and I'll talk a little bit about those in just a minute. The Portland bricks that dot the streets of Trinidad, Cuba, are symbolic of the intricate relations between Portland and Latin America. Well, look at that. Once again, uh, my friend Linda Ash Ford, who was in Trinidad, Cuba a few years ago, the streets in Trinidad, Cuba are still, today, lined with the ballast stones of main built vessels, a testament to this close economic relationship. So here we see this is the largest building on the Portland waterfront in the 19th century. This is John Bundy Brown's sugar refinery. Uh, processing 200 hogshead, hogshead is a 63 gallon cask of molasses a day. Uh, by the 1860s, employs 1,000 individuals daily, right? And a lot of the people who work there are Irish immigrants who live in the uh, a surrounding community. Um, about this time, 1860, 20% of all the molasses in the U.S. processed in Portland, more than any other city in the United States. So more molasses than Boston, more molasses than New York, more molasses than any city in the United States is being processed right here in Portland in this seven-story tall building, uh, which, by the way, uh, burns to the ground during the Great Fire of 1866, as does much of the city. Uh, when I do tours, I, I do this thing with my tour groups now, where if I say Great Fire, I make them say 1866. It's kind of fun. 
So great fire of? 18th Very good. Uh, and sugar apparently burned spectacularly. This building smoldered for days and days. Now it's rebuilt, but it never, um, the, the industry never reattains its significance in Portland that it had before the Great Fire. Uh, but this, as I said, largest uh, building and the largest building, uh, largest business uh, in Portland uh, in the 19th century. So farms and lumber camps of northern New England, including Vermont and New Hampshire, produced food and lumber for the sugar plantations. In turn, lumberjacks and farmers consumed large quantities of molasses and rum, um, like large quantities of rum. Uh, these goods are shipped back and forth between the hinterland and Portland using a system of canals that are built in the 1800s. Uh, most famous of these canal systems is the Cumberland Oxford Canal, which is completed in 1830. Once again, according to Rose Maritime History of Maine, and I quote, during one winter, a country store in Pittston disposed of 90 hogshead, a hogshead once again being a 63 gallon cask or barrel, uh, 90 hogsheads of rum. A boatman on the Cumberland Oxford Canal reported that during the season, he alone delivered 300 barrels, a barrel being a 42-gallon cask, uh, to the towns along his route. So large quantities of rum and molasses going into the interior. And so this is, you know, historians talk about uh, the entrepot or the metropole and the hinterland. So in this case, the hinterland is the interior of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, they're sending all of the things that they grow and the lumber down these canal systems to Portland, the entrepot. In return, uh, you have large quantities of um, molasses, rum, a little bit of sugar, uh, as well as lots of finished goods that people would have needed on their farms and in the lim lumber camps. Um, this is kind of that, how the trade between the entrepot and the hinterland worked here in Maine. So, once again, if you were a working class person, um, you would use molasses to sweeten your food. And you would want to sweeten your food because it tasted really gross. This is before refrigeration. And one of the things I find of particular interest is historic food preservation, uh, in part because I really like to eat food and I'm really interested in history. Uh, so the, the, the confluence of those two topics is of particular interest to me. And so, you know, before refrigeration, all of your food had to be preserved. It had to be smoked, it had to be pickled, it had to be in some way cured, right? Um, and especially up here in Maine, where nothing really grows in the wintertime, you'd have to eat a lot of preserved food. Uh, you would eat so much preserved food that by the time spring came along, you'd be a little backed up, if you will, right? Uh, and the settlers up here in the colonial period, I don't know, I can't remember what the herb was, but they ate a certain herb to induce uh, spring cleaning, if you will, because of this diet of preserved food. So once again, up, you know, refrigeration, you know, re historically New Advent, only been around since about 1900. So once again, before 120, 125 years ago, all of your food had to be preserved uh, and, and it tasted kind of gross and so you would want to sweeten it. And so once again, if you were a lumberjack or a farmer, you would do that with molasses. Now, if you were a rich, well-to-do merchant, sugar, refined white sugar, which is what they were producing at the J.B. Brown Sugar Refinery. So here you have uh, ornate sugar bowl, right? Uh, this is a, co a, sh a cone of refined white sugar, and these are sugar nips, and you would use the sugar nips to nip off a little bit of sugar. And so if you were a well-to-do merchant, if you were a person of substance, and you lived in Portland uh, at that time, and somebody came over, you would have this ornate sugar bowl on your dining room table, uh, and you would uh, and say, yeah, would you care for a bit of refined white sugar in your tea? And that's how, once again, people knew that you were uh, a person of substance, that you were well-to-do, a luxury commodity. Um, how, do you guys remember, how many sugar bowls in the um, Portland Museum of Art collection? Do you remember? Over 80. Over 80. Listen to that. Over 80 sugar bowls just in the Portland Museum of Arts collection. Uh, the Maine Historical Society has like another 60 ornate sugar bowls in their collection. So it's like a testament to how important this was as a method of showing off your wealth, right? This was like the, you know, like the luxury car of its day. This is how, this is what signified that you were a well-to-do person. You had this sugar bowl. You could afford refined white sugar. 
And so here you see, this is John Bundy Brown, the gentleman who owned the sugar refinery, uh, lived from 1804 to 1881, began his Portland, Maine career in the wholesale grocery business, later branched into the sugar and molasses business with the Portland Sugar Company. Very successful venture for which he involved his oldest son, uh, Philip Henry Brown. The Portland Sugar Company, once again, burns to the ground during the Great Fire of? Very good. Other ventures included railroads, hotels. Uh, after his death, he left behind a wealthy estate of which his sons, uh, Philip Henry Brown and John Marshall Brown, the sons of J.B. Brown and Sons, were the executors. Uh, Brown's contributions to the architectural history of Portland include his home on the Western Promenade, known as Brom Hall, uh, and the J.B. Brown Block, which is on Congress Street in Portland today. And I, that's a quote from the Main Memory Network. So here we see Bromhill now. It's his palatial mansion that he built on the Western Prom. I thought it had burned to the ground, but I found out recently that it would, in fact didn't burn to the ground, uh, that it, w it was dismantled, I think, in the early 20th century. Um, so he, you know, he buys all of the land on the Western Promenade in Portland, and he builds his palatial mansion there. And then he sells the other plots of land off to his other rich merchant buddies. So all of those beautiful palatial mansions that you see on the Western Prom today in Portland, as well as the Eastern Promenade, uh, many of them were built off of the proceeds uh, from the sugar industry or other subsidiary industries. Also, uh, he be goes on to become a major patron of the arts in Portland, and my understanding is that his art collection uh, is the beginning of the Portland Museum of Arts art collection. He donates all of his art after he dies. So here we see this is the J.B. Brown uh, block today uh, on Congress Street. It happens to be right across the street from uh, the main College of Art and Design where I teach college students history, which they learn reluctantly. Uh, J.B. Brown building Congress Street built by his sons Philip Henry and John Marshall in the years 1882 to 1883 to honor their late father. The company, the J.B. Brown Company, the Brown Company, still involved in commercial real estate in the city today. In fact, in 2020, they developed 51 residential units and a retail space at 40 Free Street in Portland. Uh, their very own website describes the company as, quote, still family owned. Now marinate on that for a sec, right? The wealth that they generated off of in the labor of enslaved Africans in the 1800s is still helping this family buy commercial real estate in Portland today. Right? It's a testament to this generational wealth. Uh, Safford House, 93 High Street, head of Greater Portland Landmarks, although I believe they just sold the building, uh, was built by merchant William Safford in 1858. He made much of his money through the importation of molasses from Cuba. Uh, he had an office in Cardenzas, Cuba, where he frequently journeyed to conduct his business and to look after his sugar interests. In fact, he's there so often, uh, one of his children, his daughter Inez, is born in Cardenzas in 1848. Once again, a testament uh, that these rich merchants, they owned uh, the boats that the molasses was shipped on, they owned the plantations where the sugar was produced, and of course they owned the enslaved Africans as well, uh, and then they had their beautiful homes here in Portland. So um, once again, I'll quote from David Carey Jr.'s essay, um, Comunidad Escondita, and he says, by the late 1820s, Cuba had become the world's largest sugar producer, and most of it was going to the United States and England. Concurrently, Maine supplied Cuban planters with salt fish to feed their slaves, and Portland was Maine's fish export center. By selling the food that sustained them and consuming what they produced, Maine's major port became a primary beneficiary of Cuban slaves' labor. Maine's historical relationship with slavery is complex. Its collaboration with Cuban slavery contra contradicts its stance against domestic slavery. Portland entrepreneurs who feasted on Cuban sugar stood in stark contrast to Maine's abolitionist movement and the state's contribution of troops to fight the Civil War. And just a little side note here, not everybody in Maine was an abolitionist, by the way. Uh, they had anti-abolition riots in 1836, and then again in 1847 in Portland, Maine, where abolitionist speakers were shouted down and prevented from speaking. 
And uh, in one case, they had to be hustled out of the church where they were supposed to speak uh, because people were scared for their physical safety. They were afraid that these anti-abolitionist rioters were going to physically harm them. Um, so paradoxically, Portland was structurally involved with slavery abroad, yet intolerant of it on their own soil. This cognitive dissonance, love that term, this cognitive dissonance, what's that mean? They just didn't want to think about it, right? This cognitive dissonance reveals moral standards that were malleable in the face of profits and comfort. So I told you, maritime historian, I studied the historic North Atlantic fishery. One of the books I really enjoy is Cod, Biography of the Fish That Changed the World. And I, I, I know this by heart at this point in time, right? So they caught a codfish off the coast of Massachusetts in 1895 that weighed 211 pounds. It was six feet in length. How big of a codfish is that, folks? That's right. Check me out. I'm six feet tall. I weigh about two, a little over 211 today. So we're talking about codfish the size of this guy is what they were catching historically. And this is in 1895, right? So we're not talking 1695. It's not 1795. This is like a little over 100 years ago. They're catching these enormous codfish. Um, they're not catching cod this size any longer because cod has been severely overfished. There's a high quota. You can hardly catch any cod. What cod you find in the fish market is very expensive. Supply and demand issue, right? Now, the important thing here is that the reason why cod is so important is it takes the preservation process, it takes the salting process better than any other protein known to man. A critically important factor before refrigeration, right? So the reason why is cod is a very lean flesh. It doesn't have a lot of fat content. Fat is the enemy of preservation. So codfish being a very lean flesh, it takes this salting process better than any other protein known to man. And so therefore, large quantities of salted cod are shipped to the West Indies where it feeds enslaved Africans. Once again, this is the cheapest protein available before refrigeration. Now, better quality cod goes to the Mediterranean where it feeds people, uh, Catholic, um, Catholics on their meatless Fridays. So uh, people who live in Spain, Italy, France, um, Portugal, that's where the best quality salt cod goes. Now, has anybody ever seen salt cod? It's also known as bacala. Yeah, a couple people. So, I mean, you know, people here in Maine, they, a lot of people have seen salt cod or cooked with it. You, so if you've seen salt cod before, you know, hard as a board, right? They take it, they salt it, you put it out in the sun for a couple days, and it becomes hard as a board. But then you take that piece of salt cod and you immerse it in water, and you have to do this for a couple days, it rehydrates and it reconstitutes, it desalinates, and it regains that flaky, uh, delightful texture of codfish. And I tell people, uh, folks used to do this in the top tanks of their toilets, when they had old-fashioned toilets with the tanks, right? And the college kids will be like, ew, gross. No, silly, it's not the poo water, right? It's the water from the top tank. But every time they flush the toilet, they're changing that water and they're taking the salt out of it, right? And so you would have to change the water several times uh, to desalinate it. But once again, the significance of cod is it's the cheapest protein available. And as we saw in the previous slide, um, Portland, Maine is the major uh, codfish export center. So this is a picture that I have in my collection. This is the fishing fleet in Portland in 1882. And for those of you who know Portland, um, this is harbor fish today, right? And so still today, the fishing boats come right into the same location. The catch goes right off the boats and right into harbor fish market where their team of expert fish cutters uh, fillet the fish. This is what's known as a flake yard here. So once again, Portland, 1882. Uh, each one of these large tables called a flake. They were also known as stages. Each object on this uh, flake is an individual fillet of cod that's been salted and left in the sun to cure to become salt cod. Look at the scale of this industry, fo uh, industry folks. Check it out. As far as the eye can see, flakes for salt cod. And once again, so this is 1882. So it's hypothetical, hypothetically, once again, slavery is legal on the island of Cuba until 1886. This salt cod could be on its way to Cuba to feed enslaved Africans. Not necessarily, but possible. This is the flake yard Portland, same period. And uh, South Portland, where I'm living and uh, where I happen to be the director of the Cushing's Point Museum, uh, the House Island is right off of Willard Beach. Um, and House Island, uh, they used to have the same thing, stages or flakes, and they would cure... Uh, the catch there, uh, salt cod. Also, large quantities of mackerel 
uh, caught here in the Gulf of Maine and shipped to the West Indies to feed the enslaved Africans. Another major commodity was lumber. Um, Portland uh, and the West Indies, much of Cuba's forests had been burned down to make room for sugar plantations. Uh, in fact, the island of Cuba, for all intents and purposes, is a monoculture uh, in the 1800s. They've cut down the forests, they're not growing food crops because the sugar is so profitable. So they're just almost uh, exclusively growing sugar cane. Uh, and so hence, Maine supplies the lumber that builds a lot of the plantations. Um, the port of Matanzas, for example, built almost entirely out of New England lumber. Maine also supplies many of the boxes and casks that sugar and molasses are shipped in. So here's some, you ready for some real nerdy stuff, right? All right, so a barrel, a barrel is the size of a cask, right? So when you think barrel, you're really thinking of casks. A tierce is the size of cask. A hogshead is the size of cask. A tune, also the size of cask. A barrel is just the size of cask, right? And so coopers are people who made casks. Very good. So once again, I'll quote from Rowe. He said, many small sawmills were busy sawing and fitting the box boards to proper lengths already to be set up and nailed on the sugar plantation. The coopers trade, cooper is somebody who makes casks, the coopers trade and the manufacture of hogshead and tears Shooks was one of the best paid in town near the coast. In 1867, there were 263 su such shops in the state. Uh, as has been explained, the shook was a package of red oak staves and heading numbered and ready to be set up as a hogshead, tears, or cask when needed. This was done by the coopers on plantations or by the state of Maine Coopers who went out to the islands for that purpose. So what he's saying here is that they would ship the casks to the West Indies, they would break them down into their components. So the staves would be all numbered so they could be reassembled, they would have the headers and then the hoops and they would all be broken down to conserve space so they could be shipped to the West Indies. Once they got to the West Indies, these boxes or casks would then be assembled. Sometimes Coopers from Maine would go to the islands in the winter. This was the time of year when they had the least employment here in New England. They would go to these islands like Cuba in the winter and assemble the casks there. Then also there were house frames all ready to put up. Imagine that, whole houses being shipped to the West Indies from Maine. Whole houses broken down, ready to be assembled once they got to the plantations. Uh, house frames all ready to put up, oxen and horses for the plow. So draft animals, right, to work the mechanisms on the sugar plantations. And there was a great, uh, this gentleman, Jared Hardesty Ross, wrote a great book, and I can't remember the title of it right now, but it was a, just came out last year, and it was about uh, enslaved Africans growing chocolate in Suriname, once again, that Dutch colony in South America that I was telling you about. And they really needed draft animals in Suriname. Now, this is fascinating. So they stipulated that you could only trade in Suriname if you brought draft animals with you, right? Otherwise, you couldn't trade there. So they bred in Rhode Island a special horse that was short and compact so they could put it on the boat, but was strong so that it could work the mechanisms on the plantations. And they bred this special horse, and they called it a Surinama because it was specially designed to go to Suriname. 30,000 Surinamas were shipped from Rhode Island to the Dutch colony of Suriname. It's a testament to how much they needed these draft animals uh, to work the plantations. So you had, once again, houses that were broken down, draft animals, oxen, horses, um, parsnips, potatoes, onions, grain, beef, mutton, pork, pickled fish, soap, candles, and dried codfish and drums of from five to 800 pounds each. Lumber from the banks of Maine rivers, which cost there $8 a thousand, sold in Havana for 60. Beets and parsnips brought $16 a barrel in the French islands. And there the author would be referring to uh, Martinique, for example, would have been a, a French island that uh, where enslaved Africans grew sugar. And this is my uh, final slide and the end of my presentation. And this isn't really my specialty, but I do work 
with the, at the Atlantic Black Box with Dr. Kate McMahon, who works for the Smithsonian, uh, the Museum of African American History, and she works specifically for the Center for the Study of Global Slavery. And what Kate is from Maine, she now lives in Washington, D.C., works with the Smithsonian, but her research is all about the slave trade in Maine. And so Kate has a, um, a spreadsheet of over, I think it's about 270 at this point, vessels from Maine that she knows without a doubt were involved in the slave trade. So um, once again, not my specialization, but I, I, I have the privilege of working with Kate who has done all this research about the slave trade in Maine. However, I can tell you that where I'm, the town that I'm from in South Portland, uh, the Ferry Village neighborhood is, is the village that I live in. South Portland is like a series of villages and it's called the Ferry Village because that's where the ferry used to go from South Portland at the time Cape Elizabeth into Portland. So I live in the Ferry Village as did um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Nathaniel Gordon uh, Nathaniel Gordon from the Ferry Village neighborhood of South Portland is caught off the west coast of Africa by uh, American slave patrol uh, in uh, 1860, maybe 1861. Uh, he has 897 enslaved Africans on board, half of whom are children. They're packed so tightly on the slaving vessel that he has to show the Navy guys on the boat that captures him uh, how to position these enslaved Africans so they can be taken to Liberia and freed. Of course, they're not from Liberia, right? That's hundreds of miles from wherever they're from originally. But they're taken to Liberia and they're freed, uh, once again, packed so tightly on the boat that Captain Gordon has to show them how to pack these individuals on board the boat. And then he's taken uh, to New York City where he's tried and he's hung in 1862. So the slave trade becomes illegal in the United States in 1808. It's actually illegal in Massachusetts before that, and you all know Maine was part of Massachusetts up till 1820, right? So uh, I think it was 1786, the slave trade becomes illegal in Massachusetts, becomes illegal nationally in 1808, but in 1820, they deem it a piratical act punishable by death. The only individual in US history ever punished to the full letter of the law is this gentleman from South Portland, Nathaniel Gordon. And is he the only guy who's ever caught involved in the slave trade? Of course not. But people have rich friends. They know the judge. The jailer mysteriously left the door open one night and they slipped away, right? And so the only person, once again, in US history ever punished to the letter of the law is this guy, Nathan Gordon, from the Ferry Village neighborhood of South Portland. And the only reason he's hung is because that this is during the Civil War and Lincoln wants to make an example out of him. But once again, a testament to this close relationship between Maine captains uh, and vessels uh, and the slave trade. And if you'd like to know more about that topic, once again, I invite you to check out the Atlantic Black Box website. And uh, that's my presentation for this evening. And I'm happy to take questions at this time. Yeah, question back here. Where did they get the salt? Oh, I love this question. That's such a great question. Um, so Mark Kurlansky, who wrote the book Cod, guess what his next book was called? Salt. That's right. And I didn't know a lot about this topic myself, and that's why I think it's a great question. But what I found out was, you know, there's different types of salt are mined all over the world. Uh, and some salts have, you know, they have different properties. Some salt uh, would burn a cod fillet, and you wouldn't use it for preservation purposes. But one of the things they did was they had, where I grew up on Cape Cod, salt works, where they would use evaporation. So they'd use seawater, and then they would let nature take its course, and they would evaporate the water away, and they'd be left with salt. Also, they mined salt in the uh, Caribbean. There were islands that were known as salt caves, so small islands that had large salt deposits, and they would mine the salt there. Yeah, very good question. And if you want to know more about salt, read the book Salt. Yeah, uh, hand over here. Yeah, you. Yeah. So in 1886, when um, slavery was stopped in Cuba, yeah. what happened to this whole industry and the infrastructure? That they brought in indentured servants. Yeah. And so at that time, like for example in Trinidad, you might be aware that in the island of Trinidad, uh, they brought in a lot of people from India. So today, the people who live in Trinidad are a combination of descendants of people who are African slaves and people who were Indian indentured servants. So same thing, in, in some places they brought in Chinese coolies, uh, sometimes indentured servants. Now, was this slavery? Not exactly. Was it very akin to slavery? Absolutely. Did they, were these people worked to death? Most likely, yeah. Yeah, very good question though. Another question? 
Yeah, yes, sir. How do they keep the seagulls off the cup? Everybody wants to know that. I don't know. That's another great question. It's not the first time I've heard it. Here's, here's my guess. I bet they paid small boys to run around and shoo the seagulls away. But that's my best guess, yeah. But that's a, once again, a, a good question I've heard before. Uh, hand back there. Yes. Uh, how can you relate this to Yarmouth, where we yeah. had um, ships going out also? Sure. Do you think they were bringing these products in here and bringing them to Portland? Without a doubt, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that's what the process was, because we, of course, yeah. had no manufacturing yep. sugar. But you did produce the ships, right? Yeah, oh, no. absolutely. So some of the ships, I'm sure, were involved in the West Indies trade. As you know, from you know, the lecture, you can tell that mm, somewhere between 80 and 85% of the trade that took place out of Portland was with the West Indies. Uh, I'm sure Yarmouth ships were a part of that. I'm also sure that Yarmouth built ships were part of the slave trade, both illicit and, uh, and legal before 1808, so. That's uh, so the thing, you know, people don't necessarily contemplate this that much, but Maine was the United States' shipbuilding center, right? They didn't build that many vessels in South Carolina, right? They didn't build that many vessels in Virginia. So the boats that were built for the slave trade, sometimes they were purpose built as slavers, sometimes they were built for another purpose and then converted into slaving vessels. But Maine, as the center of shipbuilding here in the United States, was clearly responsible for uh, so much of the shipping uh, both in the West Indies and in the slave trade. And as I said, there was a lot of connections between the West Indies trade and this uh, second, what they called the second middle passage, the, the voyage from you know, Brazil or Cuba uh, here to the Americas. Yeah, yeah question over here. Um, I heard uh, Kate McMahon speak uh, to the Yarmouth, uh, some of the students at Yarmouth High School oh, yeah, last cool. year. Yeah, yeah. And so I know that the, she traced some of the um, family names of mm -hmm. ship captains in Yarmouth. Yeah. So I'm sure that information is available through the Atlantic Bank. Black box, absolutely. And I don't, I can't remember a lot of the names off the top of my head, but the same thing with Portland. You know, Kate has this, uh, you know, list of families that were involved in the slave trade. Some of them were Portland uh, merchants, some of them from, from Yarmouth, and, and, you know, a variety of cities throughout Maine. Uh, you know, point of interest, Bath was known as Cotton Town because of the large amount of cotton that was imported to Bath. And, you know, we don't think of Bath as a major uh, import town today, but it was, it was very significant in the 1800s. And some of you may have caught, they had uh, an exhibit at the Bath Maine Maritime Museum last winter, and it was called Bath Cotton Town. Um, and so, you know, once again, a testament to the connection between Maine and commodities that were produced by enslaved Africans. Yeah, question over here. Those horses, any, the Sir are there any remnants of them? That's a great question. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Um, this would have been quite some time ago. Um, so, you know, 1600s, early 1700s, but there, there has to be, right? I mean, it's 30,000 of them. They must have bred in Suriname and they must have had um, horse offspring, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry if you addressed this already, but no, no. What about the leg of. Uh, <laughs> Enslaved Africans coming from Africa to the West Indies, and yep. you know, whose ships and who was running them. Yeah, those were those were main built ships. Yeah, yep. So once again, Captain Gordon, uh, he was caught off the west coast of Africa. He was going to take his cargo of enslaved Africans to I can't remember if it was Brazil or Cuba, but once again, the the slave trade didn't often bring enslaved Africans directly to North America. They, they very often went to either Brazil or an island in the West Indies, and there was this second middle passage that brought them here. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, the, the, the boats that were involved in the slave trade uh, across the Atlantic, what was known as the Middle Passage, many of them were main built vessels. Yeah. And with this, you know, a body of um, historical research that's still ongoing, that's the exciting thing about it, is that you know, every day we're discovering new information about this trade and the slave trade. And you know, this history um, was purposely buried, right? I mean, this history, it, it was documented and then purposely buried because it was uncomfortable history. It didn't go with the narrative of you know, a abolitionist Maine that sent more troops to fight in the Civil War than any other state per capita. And so it was, once again, this guy's Rose chapter on the West Indies, which was published in 1948. He details the entire trade, but he doesn't mention the enslaved Africans. And so, um, you know, the, the, the history, it's not like it, it wasn't there, it was purposely buried because it made people uncomfortable. And it, it should, it should make all of us uncomfortable. We should all be uncomfortable 
uh, with this historical legacy and the fact that people are still uh, have generational wealth that they developed in this economy. Yeah, question back here. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, I have read a little bit about the kind of um, reversal of a Cuban planter elite sending family members, children to Portland and New England for school mm -hmm. to live. Have you uncovered um, stories along those lines in your research that might animate that back and forth? You know, yeah. It sounds like obviously Portland's very present. And yep. was present in Cuba, but what about the reverse? Yeah, absolutely. So once again, in that essay, uh, Comunidad Escandita, Latin American Influence in Portland, Maine, he talks about some of these um, Latin American children, like you're referencing, who would come up here to Portland and go to private school. Um, and that's probably the source that I've seen the most information on that about. But yeah, that's absolutely uh, what was a part of that exchange. And once again, a testament to the close relationship between uh, Portland and Cuba. So excellent question. Yeah, question over here. Do you have a sense of uh, how many slaves were in Portland? Yes. I do, actually. So the, um, the enslaved Africans in Portland is always a very low number, and I think that it never exceeds about 2% of the population. And in fact, following emancipation, and uh, once again, part of Massachusetts, so emancipation takes place um, right after the American Revolution in Massachusetts, so uh, if memory serves me correctly, it would have been 1786, but it's what's described as a gradual emancipation as opposed to the emancipation that took place in the American South where everybody was kind of freed all of a sudden. Uh, here, it was more like um, sometimes people just didn't tell their enslaved Africans that they had been emancipated. Maybe they didn't tell them for 20 years, right? Or they would say, well, technically you're free, but you don't know anybody and you don't really have anywhere to go. I'll build you a little shack in the backyard and you can keep on working for me and I'll pay you a small wage. Um, so, but you never have a terribly large uh, free or uh, enslaved population of Africans uh, here in Portland. Uh, in fact, by um, I think probably the population of free Africans probably peaks about 1850, 1860 in Portland, at which point in time there were probably between five and 600 uh, free people from the African diaspora living in Portland. But during the colonial period when slavery was legal, a very small percentage. But they, you had a lot of people who owned enslaved Africans. They just didn't own large numbers of them. So you had well-to-do merchants who owned enslaved Africans, but you also had just regular farmers who maybe would just own one enslaved person, and they would own that person for labor, and that enslaved African would be on the farm doing the work side by side, uh, with the farmer at that time. So you had well-to-do merchants who had enslaved Africans as servants. Uh, you had enslaved Africans who would have been trained in a variety of trades, like coopers uh, or blacksmiths, and then their owners would have collected their wages. You had enslaved Africans who were trained as mariners, which was particularly advantageous to the slave owner because they would send their enslaved African off on a voyage and then collect their wages after a couple months when they returned. In the meantime, they wouldn't have to pay to house or feed them. And then, as I said, you had enslaved Africans who were owned by people who just owned one enslaved African and would help them on the farm. So not a, not a large part of the population, but, but surprisingly, a lot of people did own enslaved Africans. They just didn't own large numbers of them. The reason being, you didn't have large-scale plantation agriculture here in Maine uh, just because the agricultural conditions, the weather didn't allow for it. However, in Rhode Island, a little bit warmer, they did have plantations that were run by enslaved Africans, uh, where they, enslaved Africans labored, um, and they produced foodstuffs that were then shipped to the West Indies to feed other enslaved Africans. But that didn't happen here because we didn't have plantation agriculture. So, very good question. Any further questions? All right, well, thanks for coming out, folks. I had a lot of fun talking with you tonight.